<laughs> is this working now? Awesome. Yeah. It, again, it's a privilege to be here um, and to be with a live audience. Um, after a year's worth of remote learning, it's been wonderful to be back in person this year in school. It's made a huge difference for both students and the adults. However, one thing's been bugging me as we've been back, and that's the fact that so many people are talking about going back to normal. Okay. Uh, let's go back to pre-COVID conditions. And I can't help but sit back and scratch my head, at least for education, is that really what we want to do? I seem to remember that pre-COVID, we were hitting record levels of teens who were suffering from things like anxiety and depression, being on uh, medications. As this graph suggests, over the last two decades, a steady increase in a sense of hopelessness amongst teens, with a rapid acceleration over the last three or four years. We've got school shootings. We've got things like achievement gaps and, and uh, or organizational gaps. This is local data from a few years ago in elementary school. And you have uh, these enormous differences in, in reading and, and math achievement for white students compared to students of color. And that represents years worth of differences between them. We also have problems with funding of education, what I like to call zip code education, the have and have nots. Is that really what we want to go back to? Is, is that the normal that we want? I, for one, don't want that. And if there's any positive effects of COVID, it's the fact that it's made these kinds of problems known to the masses, both here and around the world, especially when it comes to the, the mental health of our students and so many adults as well. And we, we all know what's been happening in the last couple of years. So with that, you know, districts around the country, they're trying reforms. You know, um, add social emotional learning skills and things like that into your schools, into your curricula. And that's all fine and good. That, that's a good positive step. But even that word reform just, it's the old, you know, scratching the, the chalkboard kind of, uh, like, mood I get into. <laughs> I've been teaching nearly 30 years. And literally every single year, there's reforms in some aspect of education. And we're still basically in the same place as when I started teaching 20, 30 years ago. Okay. I don't want reforms anymore. I want to take the advice that Thomas Jefferson gave, where he said a, a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. I think education is in need of a rebellion, a revolution, not reform. Now, what does that mean? Okay. Well, to have successful revolutions in anything, I think a couple of things have to happen up front. You first have to think in terms of what's the problem. And COVID has helped us kind of figure out what the problems are, to, again, known to the masses. But then you have to have a shift in mindset. Okay, you have to think differently about the problem. If you don't have that shift in mindset, then that means you're not going to be able to act on it. You won't be able to act differently. So change in thought leads to change in action. So, being a scientist, I think back to a revolution that was successful about 120 years ago. And that happened when we had to change from a Newtonian kind of science into quantum mechanical science. Now, anyone who's ever had high school physics, you studied Newtonian science, Newtonian physics. And that's predictable. It's deterministic. Um, you can treat things almost identically. You don't really care how big or small something is or how simple or complex it is. You kind of ignore the details. And you treat them as a number, okay, a mass. And you can plug that into some formulas. And you can predict what's going to happen into the future pretty accurately. It works beautifully for mechanical objects, inanimate objects. Now, the trouble was when they started looking and discovering little things, okay, atoms and particles, the stuff that we're all made out of, Newtonian science no longer cut it. Okay, it couldn't explain what they were seeing. So they had to have a, a shift in their thinking. Okay, they, they had to go from that Newtonian science, which they, they had practiced for hundreds of years, into something brand new, a true revolution. Okay, now, quantum science, uh, I don't know if, if anyone has any experience with that. Probably not. But, uh, <laughs> and you're probably thankful for that. But um, it's probabilistic. It's indeterminate. You know things are weird when a law of nature is called the uncertainty principle. Okay? 
So it's very, it's radically different from Newtonian science of, of the everyday world. If I had to choose one idea that kind of shows what the big differences are, I'd have to go with particle wave duality. Some of you may have heard about this in a chemistry class at, at some point. So think about, I don't know, electrons, one of the particles that we're all made out of. You probably think of it as a particle. You're probably taught that it's a, like a little planet going around the nucleus of an atom. But it turns out that these things can behave like waves. Okay, very different. Um, now, in, in quantum mechanics, to, you know, to talk about these dual personalities that the electron has, you make up something in the mathematics of, of the science. You come up with something called a wave function. Okay? And that's something where we literally have to treat the electron as being both a particle and a wave simultaneously when we're not observing it. It's, a, it's just a weird idea. And it's not until you actually observe it that one of those two personalities kind of falls out. Now, some, another feature of quantum science is that the way you look at something will actually determine which of those personalities you see. So the, the picture on the, the left over there is a beam of electrons, this is back in my lab, uh, that we sent through a little slit, and it formed that bullseye pattern. That's called an interference pattern. Only waves can do that. So in that kind of experiment, in that kind of observation, we see the wave personality. Take those same electrons and you run it through a material, and you see tracks as if it's a particle. And then if one of those went into, like through a slit, it, it switched right back into the wave personality. Very weird, but, but the way you observe something selects what you see. Now you might be scratching your head at this point, like what in the world does this have to do with education? Okay, I'm gonna tell you. Um, I think that we've been stuck, we've been trapped in a Newtonian type mindset for education for at least 100 years. And what that means is that we basically are treating our students as identical beings. Now picture this, use your own experience to kind of, kind of get the gist of this. Think back, I don't know, when, when you're like 10 years old. Okay, you went to school and then you walk into a classroom and built solely on age, there, there'll be another couple dozen 10 year olds in there. Now on the same day, you're gonna be taught and try to learn the same material using the same methods for the same period of time. You'll come back another day, and all of a sudden, you take a test, okay, the same test for the same period of time, and the teachers are, are thinking, or at least hoping, that the results are more or less the same. Okay? Even if they're not, you have to keep moving because you have to get through the content. You have to finish the class because at the end of the year, there's that standardized test you have to take, which schools and teachers are judged by. Okay, so in that kind of system, you have winners and losers. We know that that doesn't work for everybody. Um, some will get it if they can adapt to that kind of education. Others are gonna fall behind. And then what happens to those students? Well, if, if we don't help them, they start to take a hit in self-confidence. They fall further behind. They might act out and get in trouble. They're the, the, the students that the teachers talk about, and students, yes, teachers talk about you all the time and to each other. <laughs> that, that's, that those are the, the children that you have to watch out for. Um, it doesn't work, and it hasn't. Look at these photos, 1920, 2020. Okay, we're still treating everybody identically. It's standardized. It's assembly line education, cookie cutter. This is why we need the, the revolution, not just reforms. So I'm suggesting that we move into a quantum mindset. And my inspiration for this is none other than our friend, the electron. Now we're made out of them, so we might as well give it the benefit of the doubt and listen to it. Um, I like this idea of the wave function. And being a, <laughs> the ultimate science geek, um, I've come to think about human beings as quantum creatures. Now, what I mean by that is kind of summed up here. Think of all the different moods or emotional states, personalities, whatever term you want to use that human beings can have. We're a big old mix, a blend of all of that, and it's unique to each of us. Whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, 
Now, the, the size of the fonts on here might represent the odds of somebody falling into that mood when you, when you actually observe them, interact with them. Okay. Um, think about your best friend or family member who's not here right now. If I were to ask you, well, at this moment, even though they're not here, what is their mood? What's their emotional state right now? And what, what would you have to say? I say, some people shrugging their shoulders. That's exactly right. You have no idea. But I bet you could place the odds on them being happy or sad or excited or bored or whatever. Take your pick. You're assigning probabilities for one of those personality states. I would call this our, our personality wave function. This is exactly what we do when we talk about quantum science and how we treat particles. It's the same idea. I would also suggest that we have a second wave function, an intellectual wave function. Okay? We all have different strengths and skills and interests and talents and different intelligences. Some people learn, uh, some people literally can't sit down. Um, they have to be moving in order to think. Um, maybe you're more mathematical and logical. Maybe you're more musical. Okay? We know that's different. We know we're all different from each other. But why don't we treat kids that way in school? Why don't we recognize that? I think this is a better representation of the way humans really are than trying to think of them as being cookie cutter and being just products on an assembly line. So this is where the revolution has to start. You have to think differently before you can act differently. Okay? That's what causes revolutions to happen. Okay. Now, as, as one example of what quantum education might look like, I want to talk about just briefly something that we used to do in the Evanston schools. There was a partnership between the public schools and Northwestern, which actually ran the program, called Project Excite. So some years ago, we decided to take on uh, the achievement gap that I mentioned earlier. We wanted to see if finally, after decades of trying reforms, of thinking Newtonian, um, nothing, there's no progress in that. So we, we wanted to take a different approach, okay? a quantum approach. We didn't want to just give a few extra problem sets of math and suddenly think they're going to learn math from that. That had been done to death for, for many, many years. Instead, we wanted to think of them as that big, mixed, beautiful bag of, of emotions and talents. Okay, treat them as individuals. We also know that this is a long-term solution. It's, it's not going to happen overnight. We've tried yearly things, just so many yearly things since I've been here, <laughs> and nothing has worked. Um, it's a comprehensive approach. Okay, so what this means is that we, we knew that the gap was from early ages. In fact, it goes all the way down into kindergarten. The gap's already there. Um, we started with third graders. And when we worked with them, we didn't work in the elementary schools. We brought them to us in the high school, okay, the, the big school. They got to meet and work with juniors and seniors, okay, the, the big kids, their role models. The parents were on board, and they supported this long-term effort. Each time we met with them, a different teacher came up with a lesson in a different topic with different methods. So we're hitting some of the strengths of everybody at some point, not leaving anyone behind. We called it Excite. That doesn't have anything to do with the content or the academics. We focused on the social-emotional side of the student. We all know if you want to learn something new, if you don't feel confident, if you don't feel like you belong, you're simply not going to learn to your potential. That's just part of life. That's part of being human. So let's focus on that. Let's build up the confidence of our students of color from an early age so that by the time they get to the high school, they feel like they belong. They can have the same opportunities that most of our white students have had forever. So putting all this together, this whole big quantum package, okay, just a different way of doing things, this is what we started with, this slide I showed earlier. And if I add the Excite students, the green line in the middle there, after a few years, they caught up. By the time they went into the high school, they were achieving academically on par with our white students. They were taking the honors level classes and AP classes. 
They're getting involved in all the extracurriculars. They're going to college. Okay? Something that had never been done before, certainly here, we achieved by changing the mindset and acting differently. So it can be done. I'll leave you with this thought. Now, people my age, you'll remember 20 years ago, uh, there was the federal policy for education in the United States was called No Child Left Behind. Great title. I, I, I can't think of a better title. Of course we don't want kids to fall behind. <laughs> Not a single one. The trouble is, which of the two approaches, Newtonian or quantum, was that structured on? It was entirely Newtonian. It was old school. It was built around standardization and standardized tests. And unfortunately, over, over 20 years of doing this, we've left millions of kids behind. I want to keep the title. I love that sentiment. And I, I just, I'm not creative, so I can't think of anything better. So, <laughs> so let's keep calling it No Child Left Behind. That's fine. But we have to take a different approach. We have to get educators and the, the adults here to think about kids as real human beings, as complex, individualized human beings, different strengths and weaknesses. We need variety. We need comprehension, long-term thinking, which we tend to be very poor at. Um, I'm convinced that if we can do that and start thinking differently with the masses of educators, we're going to make a difference because that forces you to think differently in the classroom. Okay. If you, if you understand human beings a little more realistically than what we have been doing for the last hundred years. So let's keep that title and let's actually mean what we say this time and leave no child ever, ever behind again. We can do this. We have to do it. It's our kids we're talking about. Let's get to work. Thank you.